so this is as young people are getting diagnosed to be on the spectrum or neurodiverse, society has an obligation to step up and do their part in helping find the right ways to help nurture them in school, in college, and then in workplaces. And, and I think too often we discard people for their disabilities instead of embracing them for their abilities. And so many of them have such unique abilities and they shouldn't just be stocking shelves or grocery carts somewhere. You're listening to episode 52 of the Happy Space podcast. Today, I'm speaking with Suba Berry, president and CEO of Saramount, about practical and effective ways to approach DEI. Hi, I'm Claire Kumar, your proudly neuroatypical host, exploring the intersection of productivity and inclusivity. I believe that everyone ought to be able to make their richest contribution, but too often people are excluded from spaces, cultures, and experiences. We can do better. I hope that you find inspiration and encouragement in these conversations, for everyone deserves a happy space. Some might say this is a tough time for DEI in 2024 in North America, but in this episode, you will find renewed enthusiasm and vigor from uh, today's guest. If you've been listening for a while, you'll already be familiar with Sarah Mount from my conversation with Katie Mooney in episode 41, where we spoke about how DEI efforts must change to have maximum impact. We spent a lot of time talking about how they must be embedded in everything an organization does today. Sarah Mount, as you may know, is a leading strategic professional services and research firm dedicated to building high-performing, inclusive workplaces, and today works with over 600 organizations globally. My guest today is Sarah Mount CEO, Subha Berry. Suba will share parts of her journey from being a successful investment advisor to heading up DEI initiatives to now being one of the leading DEI voices in North America. In our conversation, we'll talk about Suba's personal motivations to step into this work, close connections to neurodiversity, and practical advice for those who want to further diversity and inclusion efforts in today's corporate climate. You'll also find out several reasons why the autistic intern program that Suba began in her prior role at Freddie Mac was recognized for its achievements. I have no doubt you'll be as charmed as I was with the combination of warmth and pragmatism in Suba Berry. Suba Berry, so thrilled to have you joining me on the Happy Space podcast. Welcome. Well, it's my pleasure to be with you. Thank you so much for inviting me. Well, I talked to Katie Mooney, as you know, uh, some time ago, who's on your team. And it was such a riveting conversation uh, that I kept learning more about Sarah Mount and more about what you do. And I thought, you know, you posted um, the 2024 research and I was notified of that um, really formidable research. And I thought there was an invitation to have a conversation with you and I jumped at it. So thank you. Thank you for doing me the honor. I think it's really important for people to hear from diversity, equity, inclusion leaders to understand their perspectives a bit about their journey and for you to have an opportunity to leave some positive impressions and invitations for people to, to really be effective in today's climate. Um, so I'd love to start with just a little bit of, maybe you can paint the picture of how you got to where you are now. What was your personal motivation and how you ended up at Saramount? And then we've got a few other questions for lined up. That's wonderful. Well, I actually grew up in India. I came to this country. I had a scholarship to go to university. I went to Rice University in Houston, Texas. So you can imagine I came from, you know, fairly hot India to just as hot Texas. Uh, so, so, um, but to me, it was um, the first part of that journey was, you know, I had grown up as part of the majority population in India. So mm -hmm. I almost felt like I learned how to be a minority after coming to this country. 
Yeah. I, yeah. I, I feel you. I, I spent three years in Japan where being a person of color, I mean, it, it was very homogeneous society at that point. That's so. exactly right. And, and in many ways, Texas was too. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so, so I started my career in financial services. I was a commodities trader. I was a wealth advisor and it was really um, probably in 1997, I had my first of six bouts with cancer. And I've had a Hodgkin's disease five times and breast cancer once. And in that journey, I began to think about things that most people don't think about till they're in their 60s or 70s, which is about legacy and, you know, what impact have I had in the world and, you know, bigger esoteric uh, um, you know, thoughts about, you know, what is the meaning of life and the like. And one of the things I noticed is I looked around me and there was really literally nobody who looked like me, meaning to say it was a homogenous white male and a few white female organization in my branch office at Merrill. And I remember going and asking my manager why he had not, and I was very successful for them, so asking them why they had not packed the place with people like me. And his answer really, you know, sort of shook me to my core. Mm -hmm. He said, Suba, we got lucky with you. We're not pushing our luck again. And to me, I, I thought all my hard work, everything that I have brought to this job was, was considered luck. And I knew that wasn't the case. And that's when I began to realize that the barriers to entry, the biases in processes, mm -hmm. things that hold people back. It isn't one big, bold, bodacious, you know, someone being racist. It is death by a million cuts. Yeah. yeah. Small inequities, little ways in which you're not included. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, it shouldn't be that difficult. And then I uh, essentially moved over and started a multicultural business development unit at Merrill. And what was interesting about that work was, I thought to myself, if I could prove that there is business opportunity, that there is money to be made mm -hmm. by being inclusive, yeah. that people would find religion and that didn't happen. They were happy to do business with, you know, Black, Hispanic, Asian, South Asian, East Asian community of people with disabilities, gays and lesbians. It, it, it was as though money was green and that was great, but actually hiring somebody to come in and sit at the desk next to you was still, you know, there were barriers to it. Mm -hmm. And that's when I went and uh, became the first global head of diversity for Merrill Lynch really built out the infrastructure. So my approach to this has always been, let's make sure it's connected to the business, whether it's the customers, whether it's the talent and the diversity of thoughts and perspectives and ideas, that talent that grows up differently brings to the mix. And that could be, you know, I grew up in India, so I bring a different mindset to it. Somebody that is, uh, you know, that has a visible or invisible disability has a way in which the lens through which they look at the world. Mm -hmm. uh, you may come from a socioeconomically disadvantaged background. You may be an immigrant. So many ways in which your lived experience informs you about how to make life just a little bit easier and simpler for others. And that kind of creativity, the innovation, the idea that if you bring people from all these different backgrounds, that when you put them together, they're going to come up with brilliant, amazing ways to solve for issues that you would have never thought about. So to me, diversity was always about that connection, whether talent, whether customers, it, it, it always had to be embedded into the business. And so... After Merrill Lynch, I went to Freddie Mac. I taught gender policy at Columbia. And then I came to Working Mother in the year 2015. And that was what Sarah Mount used to be known as Working Mother Media. We yeah, started. I remember the magazine. Yep. 40 yeah. years ago, we started as that. Mm -hmm. And so the idea that if, if you can do this work inside a company the way I did at Merrill, or you could be an organization outside being a partner and a guide 
And today we're a partner and guide to 600 plus organizations in their DEI journey. You know, whether it's assessments or advisory services or talent development, uh, events and conferences, benchmarking, we do a variety of things, but essentially arming them with everything they would need to create those inclusive workplaces. So people like me that walk in the door are no longer the only one of their kinds because companies are waking up to all the gifts that we bring them. And that includes, you know, a recent big focus has been on neurodiversity. And what is really interesting about that is people who are neurodiverse bring a very different mindset to the organization. And we've always thought about, oh, how are we accommodating? Not whether it's neurodiverse or even it's physical disabilities, we always sort of reduce it to, oh my God, there's a price and cost to accommodation. Mm-hmm. Except every day we are all being accommodated. I'm sitting here, I have a light above me here that's lighting up this room. The question is, if I were sight impaired, if I were blind, I wouldn't need the light. I never think about that as accommodation. And yet every day I'm being accommodated with things that they offer. Somebody in a wheelchair can come up and sit at this desk without needing a chair. I have a chair sitting under me. I never think about that as accommodation. And yet it is, isn't it? Well, and our glasses. We're both wearing glasses. That, I know. You know I, I hate to think what I, my day would be like if I didn't have them. So I think about this a little differently. And it is that mindset that I hope Saramount brings uh, to its partner organization to help guide their journey uh, and, and get to a place where they are known as a talent magnet for all different types of people, because that's what makes us really rich and successful. Yeah. And you lived it. And we know that the science backs up that claim that diversity actually leads to richer results. I want to go back just for a moment to that when you started that multicultural, um, the organization um, at Merrill, what kind of support did you feel you needed from leadership to to actually bring that to bear? Can you you just, I'm thinking there may be something in your story that unlocks somebody who's listening, who's looking for leadership support. Uh, Is there something that you can share there? Hey, Happy Space listeners. If you're looking to boost your team's performance, look no further. As a productivity expert and inclusivity advocate, I love showing leaders how inclusivity is the key ingredient in team performance. We travel beyond lip service and explore helping everyone truly bring their best selves to work. Ready to see your team soar? Visit clairekumar.com and book a discovery call today. So the first thing I talk about is, and this generation does it so beautifully, this is the notion of crowdsourcing ideas, Mm -hmm. okay? Whether it's crowdfunding someone's need or crowdsourcing an idea as a solution for something. The idea that people uh, become open to asking for different ways to solve for issues and challenges in organizations. You know, HR does not have to be the only group that solves for talent issues. Mm -hmm. Every employee has a voice and should find a way to be able to express ideas. How do you become the kind of organization where the people that work for you say, this is so great that I can't wait for this, you know, friend I have in my network that is so smart that I want them to come and work at this company. Mm -hmm. How do you, how do you create that? So the idea is as you bring, as you share more of the challenges instead of figuring out, oh, I have to be a leader manager. I have to have this title. I have to be in this department to solve for it. Mm. You walked away from that and came to the point where you said, great ideas, anybody can come up with it. Irrespective of rank, title, division, department, junior, senior, whatever it is, Mm -hmm. come bring your ideas and really begin to engage your talent in helping you solve for the issues you have. Mm -hmm. So the issue may be, I'm not able to uh, attract um, enough people of color into my organization. Let's assume that's it. Mm -hmm. So take the talent that you do have and ask them, Mm -hmm. what can we do to be better at this? Instead of assuming that your HR team is the only one charged with somehow changing that. 
Mm -hmm. Be surprised is what comes from it. So this idea of what happened that, you know, I had this idea for building this multicultural business development group that came from a very, very simple um, observation. Mm -hmm. I was at my local Wegmans grocery store in Princeton, New Jersey. And walking down the aisles, I saw that there was an entire aisle dedicated to Asian food. I'm talking, they had Thai, they had, you know, Indian, they had Chinese, they had Malaysian, they had, and then same thing with the Hispanic aisle. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, why do you think Wegmans is putting it out there? If they had a predominantly, you know, white demographic that ate a certain kind of food, they wouldn't bother. They're doing it because the demographic in and around Princeton was changing and they were really addressing the needs of that demographic. And what was amazing was I used to make a trip once a month to Edison, New Jersey to get all my Indian groceries. I get you. (laughs) And and guess what? I could go to Wegman and get it. Mm. And if Wegman could figure out that there's enough people living in West Windsor, Plainsboro, Princeton that were from the South Asian community that they had to Mm. cater to our needs... Like, why wouldn't Merrill Lynch figure that out? Mm -hmm. And why was that important? Because you need people coming from that community, walking in the door in your office, looking and seeing a reflection of themselves in the people sitting in that office. And if there's nobody there that looked like them, I'm not saying that there wouldn't be people who would come and still do business. But I'm going to say to you that that is something you observe. When I see ads yeah. Why am I, why, why does seeing another South Asian put a smile on my face? Okay. I so relate to that. I'm, I mean, I immigrated to Canada when I was four and we were in smaller places than Toronto and there wasn't diversity and I was the only other. And I didn't, uh, I wasn't proud of my Indian heritage until probably I got to university. And then I was really able to embrace who I was. And it's a great conversation started. Where are you from? In Toronto now, we have over 50% of people from elsewhere. And so it's remarkably diverse. But you travel three or four hours north, it goes down to four or five percent. Remarkably mm-hmm. different. Remarkably different. But it's it's really interesting. In Canada, we've had massive immigration in the last uh, year or two in particular, to the point where I would say our prime ministers created a bit of a fire fest and not, not really managed it particularly well. But the number of uh, people from India, even two, two people on my floor, two apartments on my floor, new people from M- Mumbai, mm-hmm. um, there's a different energy shift. Even the front desk, they were speaking Hindi to um, guests, residents that lived the floor below me. There's a massive shift going on in who's coming into the country and how are we how are we bridging into organizations now is a really interesting question. The young girl down the hall, she works in HR. She's working in Staples, which you have in the States as well. And she's she's like, I want a job in HR. And but they want Canadian experience. So it's it's really interesting to look at the experience and the culture. But with the immigration, there is there's a huge population to serve with this mixed identity and new emerging identity. That's right. Yeah, it's really fantastic. I want to come back to your comments about neurodiversity, because as I look at the conversation in inclusivity, this seems to be a really burgeoning topic. I know in the UK, it's being talked about and and well, I think better understood than perhaps in North America right now. Um, But I wanted to talk about a little bit about your journey with respect to neurodiversity and understanding that and why it's so important to you. And then what you think is Um, happening in the marketplace with companies' response to understanding the value that this way of being brings? So I have to tell you that I uh, probably had my first exposure uh, to neurodiversity after I moved to Princeton. Mm -hmm. Uh, We moved there in the year uh, 1999 or 2000, and I had a neighbor who had a son on the autism spectrum. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, uh, what well, he wasn't particularly high functioning, but he was lovely. He was an adorable boy at that time. And he, you know, he used to love, we used to have a movie theater in our basement and he used to love coming and watching, um, you know, videos in it. And he would love swimming in our pool. So I learned a little something about, um, you know, what was, 
what was different about them, but also what was unique about them. And, and um, I remember, for example, he had this um, photographic memory for train schedules. So if you needed to get to New York Penn Station by you know, 8.30 a.m., he would tell you exactly what time you needed to leave your home mm -hmm. to get drive to the train station and park your car and get to which train and, mm -hmm. you know, he knew every stop along the way. And so it always fascinated me. The other thing he used to do was you could give him your date of birth and he would tell you what day it was, like in a nanosecond. Wow. Yeah. Always thought like, what is happening in your brain that allows you to do that? It was like, he was a genius. Mm -hmm. And yet I know his parents worried deeply about um, what would happen to him after they had passed mm -hmm. uh, or even as he was growing up, you know, where would he work? What, what kind of mm -hmm. work would he do, et cetera. Yeah. And, and I began to think about that as, you know, so this is as young people are getting diagnosed to be on the spectrum or neurodiverse. Mm -hmm. Um society has an obligation to step up and do their part in helping find, uh, you know, the right ways to help nurture them in school, in college, and then in workplaces. Mm -hmm. and, and I think too often we discard people for their disabilities instead of embracing them yeah. uh, for their abilities. And so many of them have such unique abilities and they shouldn't just be stocking shelves or grocery carts somewhere. Um, and, and it is with that thought and idea that uh, in the year 2010, 11, I helped to start a um, autism internship program at Freddie Mac. We had two leaders uh, both of whom at Freddie Mac had children on the spectrum. One had a boy, one had a girl, and they were very senior. They were in the C-suite with me. Yeah. Uh, and essentially, we really thought about, could we take and understand what are the different jobs that we have within Freddie that lent themselves to being done better by somebody on the spectrum than somebody who is not neurodiverse? Mm -hmm. And the reality was we identified five jobs uh, in various divisions, and we began to recruit neurodiverse individuals with those skill sets. Mm -hmm. And I remember the first interview that I did. I actually was part of the interview. First question was, you know, we were guided to, and we did do that. We gave them the questions that we would ask them in advance of them coming in to interview. Mm -hmm. So, so there was no anxiety about it. And this is something I've realized. Sometimes when, you know, you do something that you think is something special you're doing for an individual who's neurodiverse, it's actually better for everybody. That's right. Everyone would like to be a little better prepared. This is not about, I gotcha. Let's see what you can do to sort of yeah. screw this up. Yeah. And I think we have to get out of that mentality. Anyway, this person comes in, he does the whole interview. He's amazing. And you know, I had to ask him because the entire time he made eye contact and I had been told mm -hmm. he struggled with making eye contact. And I asked him, mm -hmm. I said, you know, could you tell me, he was a young man. And I said, could you tell me, you know, how come you did? You've been looking at me. You've made mm -hmm. eye contact. And he said to me, oh, Mrs. Barry, you know, I was, you know, you're Indian. So I imagined you had a dot on your forehead and I was looking at that dot. Oh, really? I've been and, then says, <laughs> and then he says to me, I'm now so exhausted. I'm going to have to go take a nap. Wow. There's the masking. Right. Yeah. And I, and here I was thinking he's making eye contact, except he was looking at the, you know, I wasn't wearing a dot, but he, but he, he put one there. That's so because he wanted to try to make eye contact. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And of course we yeah. hired them. And what was amazing about it was there were five things that actually came out of it. One is, First, we knew that you can onboard and train people as they come in. We knew that we could only do yay so much with someone who's neurodiverse. We needed to understand what would trigger them, what kind of support would they need inside the organization when their anxiety got to be high, yeah. et cetera. We wanted to make sure we couldn't always remove the stress, mm -hmm. but we could find ways to help manage it. 
So mm -hmm. that was the first understanding. So what we did was we took their teams and we trained their teams to receive them. So they had a boss who was a mentor. They had a peer who was a mentor. And the third mentor was probably the most important. It was a member of the Freddie family who had either a family member or friend on the spectrum who could actually help if there was ever a meltdown or an issue mm -hmm. and you could get quickly to. So but we knew we needed somebody who would understand and know how to diffuse the issue. So we surrounded this person with support. Now, yeah. little quirks, sometimes they would, they would hum, they would rock, they would, you know, you've got to prepare the teams for it. Mm -hmm. What happened out of it was, in the year following, when we did the engagement surveys, the engagement level and the satisfaction level of the members of their extended team was off the chart as compared to the rest of the organization. So employee satisfaction really increased. There was an enhanced sense of gratitude in the broader Freddie family, especially mm -hmm. in those teams that had received them. Can you can you elaborate a little bit on why you think that is? Like what was the connection to compassion and watching and, and living it? It's compassion, it's watching, living it, but it is also, it brings out a sense of purpose. You know, we are all taught to believe that we feel better up about ourselves when we are in service of others. Yeah. And having somebody like that on the team, being a resource for them, allowed them, even if you've had a crappy day, when you go back, you think about the blessings in your life. Mm -hmm. And and so I really believe that it had, it enhanced the overall culture of the team and how people felt about themselves and about their company. And the last one was just about every single one of these interns turned into full-time employees. The bulk of them stayed loyal, stayed with the company. And they were these were well-paid jobs, paying yeah. 70, 80, 100, $120,000 a year. It wasn't sort of a pittance entry-level job. Mm -hmm. and so we won, the company won, yeah. because obviously you now have talent that you otherwise never would have gotten yeah. to and think about lack of turnover and all of the other enhanced benefits with it. Engagement went up, satisfaction around it went up. And then 10 years later, we were, you know, I was no longer at Freddie at that time, but Freddie received an award from the UN for having one of the most creative, innovative programs for people on the spectrum. Yeah. And so I use that as an example to say, here you think you're you're sort of doing something nice or good, but guess what? You are the one that wins in the end. And you don't go in expecting that. You think that maybe it's going to be a heavy lift and you don't. So I love that. I love that story. Is that written about anywhere? Is there some, you know, I'm sure point there people is. To? Okay. Yeah, okay. I'm sure there is, but if I can find it, I'll dig it up and send it to you. But this is a, I've been asked about of all the programs I put in place and things we did. And I've yeah. obviously been in this journey for a long time. Yeah. Uh, this is the one I'm proudest of. And you know, I have a nephew now who's 11 years old, who's on the spectrum. And uh, I would tell you that in many ways, I feel like being a part of this prepared me mm -hmm. uh, to be a guide and a source of support for my cousin, uh, because, you know, nobody, nobody goes in expecting mm -hmm. this and, and you can, you can view the cup as half empty or half full. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I love this story. I want to make a um, connection now between what I heard was, you know, C-suite level uh, members of the team with children uh, who are neurodivergent. I'm wondering how now that you see that translating to adults who are employees, knowing that this is often genetic, uh, looking at their own way of being and what What's happening at that level? So we, we see all these kids being diagnosed and parents reflecting and saying, whoa, that's me. What do you think, what conversations are happening and how, how much more comfortable are leaders potentially being able to say, that's me too? Is that happening yet? Or are we still seeing a, a bit of a lag? I think that more and more people are being diagnosed, especially women uh, tend to be diagnosed more uh you know, when they're older. Yeah. Um, I was actually quite surprised to note that 
um, Sermount itself uh, has about 10% of our uh, of our employee population identify as neurodiverse, which is, and those are the, the those are the ones that are open and public about it, that have been diagnosed. And so I, I think to myself that somewhere we're creating an environment that is open and inclusive and welcoming of someone who is neurodiverse. I would tell you that um, I think about one in five is the statistic that I most recently saw. We we mm -hmm. had a webinar recently and we had, you know, over 1500 participants that joined. Yeah. And so, you know, we, um, I think that speaking about it, being more open about it, mm -hmm. uh, creating ways in which companies can understand uh, that what they think is going to be a heavy lift and uh, an accommodation is actually not that hard. And as we are having the next generation, remember, this cuts across gender, race, ethnicity, all kinds of things, mm -hmm. uh, including socioeconomic diversity, immigrants, etc. I would say to you that more and more young people are being diagnosed as neurodiverse. And as they're getting diagnosed, schools are doing a better job mm -hmm. colleges a little bit less so but they are also doing a pretty decent job of helping support uh you know these neurodiverse individuals workplaces it's a work in progress some companies are really thinking through it very carefully mm -hmm. when you you know companies like um Freddie Mac SAP Oracle Microsoft a lot of tech companies uh, are really, uh, EY has done a yeah. phenomenal job with that. So there's lots of great examples that I can give on that. Uh, but I think that what they're also realizing is some of the um, uh, support that they provide for their neurodiverse uh, talent, mm -hmm. uh, like quiet spaces, uh, are actually things that, you know, there are days when I want a quiet space to just go in and listen to, you know, some music and just sort of calm down. Mm -hmm. So you think of it as something you're providing that's special for a particular group of people. It actually supports everyone. Yeah. Uh, people yeah. with anxiety, heightened anxiety, who may not be neurodiverse, and a quiet place would be amazing for them. Yeah. So I think companies are getting more and more open-minded and inclusive. When I our events, for example, at all our events, we have um, designated quiet places yeah. where people can go in, calm down, decompress, and I I find that the awareness is starting to build and also with it, the understanding that there is unique skills and abilities and talent that these people bring to our organizations. So mm -hmm. if that is the gift, then helping support them is a little give back. Yeah, it's, it's, it's moving from the accommodation mindset into the accessibility mindset, which has bigger, it's a bigger magnet. To your point, you know, completely making more people true. feel welcome. Completely, completely. Yeah. 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 I have to just touch on a couple of things that you said. I wanted to just go back to eye contact because I've never had a challenge with eye contact. So this was also the thing that led me to think, well, I couldn't possibly be autistic then because that's an expectation that difficulty with social interaction would be there. But in so many of the other ways of being autistic, this is why it took me till age 56 to be diagnosed. So it's really fascinating. I think what we know about something coming from Rain Man, the movie and, and media now, the, in neurodivergent ways of being, there's a, there's, there's a real diversity even within that. Of, of That's how why you call it a spectrum. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. But you know what? Claire, we are all on a spectrum, every one of us. Yeah. And, and so, you know, I, I recognized through my son's diagnosis, he has ADD, ADHD. Okay. Uh, and I realized that I too am, except I have built all these coping mechanisms along the way. I'm yeah. the most prolific list maker. Yes. <laughs> every, every once in a while, my husband will tease me and he will say to me, he says, Oh my God, you get distracted so quickly. It's like squirrel, you know, it's like I'm, ideas, I'm, possibility, I'm, everything's connecting. I get exactly. you. Exactly. Yeah. So, so how do I, how did I learn to compensate for that? I'm a prolific list maker. 
and I check things off my list and, you know, I, I am a, a prolific note taker. Yeah. And, and so a lot of things that I have developed over the course of, because obviously I wasn't diagnosed, wasn't, you know, accommodated for, yeah. and the reality is that, you know, but I recognized it through my son's journey through this. Mm -hmm. I realized that, guess what? It came from me. This is where he inherited it from. <laughs> there it I is. <laughs> yeah, it's so fascinating because I I um, identified as highly sensitive for a decade and there's ADHD in my family and my kids. And um, I thought always oh, it was their dad. And so when I got the, a, the autism diagnosis with a side order of ADHD, I was like, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> and, and I spent a lot of my, my entrepreneurial life for the first 15 years was spending a lot of time in people's homes and offices and helping them build the skills to sustain order, create order. And it's very, it's so fascinating because that's not, not my natural style isn't for a lot of structure, but to yeah. your point, it was the only way to make sense of the world, dial down the noise and be able to find a path through. So I think if we're blessed to have that drive for order, then we can get there. Where I see people struggle more, more is if they're lacking that drive to figure that out, then there's a real challenge. And that's where I came in as a coach around productivity and like, let me help you with some structure that might feel good. And it has to feel good. Otherwise, forget it. People yeah, won't use it, right? Completely yeah. true. Yeah, that's so, that's so fascinating. Um, I, I think that you talked about 20%. I know that in the highly sensitive community alone, it's 15 to 20%. They're even saying it's a typical bell curve now, so that yeah. it's 30, 40, 30, sensitive, average, not sensitive. And so I think there's a compelling argument to be made for this inclusive, accessible design. I am not seeing it yet in, in office space, in commuting environments, in all of the the parts that I found really difficult about sustaining my energy to be a good corporate employee. I was exhausted before I got to work. <laughs> I'm just, just trying to get through a subway commute in the winter, for example, it was horrific. Right. What What's your sense of the willingness to provide the options in terms of space, not only in our environments, but allowing the flexibility that I truly believe is flexibility is inclusivity. I have it on t-shirts. It's like, I really, I really believe that's part of the inclusivity accessibility strategy. Do you have any thoughts on that that could help people think about it? So there's, you know, two ways to think about it. Uh, you know, COVID taught us something. COVID taught us that work could be done and done impactfully mm -hmm. uh, being remote. Now, that doesn't mean that that's the only way to do it. It doesn't mean that it needs to be done that way all the time. Mm -hmm. a, a healthy mix, especially with young people coming into the workforce for the first time, yeah. this, this being able to uh, see colleagues, to interact with colleagues, uh, to be mentored, uh, to learn by observing, all of those are important and it's very hard to do that on a Zoom call. Mm -hmm. OK, so I think that the healthy mix is where we will end up. What what COVID has taught us is that work can be done very effectively being 100 percent remote. However, there are some distinct advantages that come from creating the opportunities for interaction. And I believe that if you could have a way in which you have a healthy mix, and I know that there are lots of other tensions at play, uh, whether it be the fact that you have all this office space now that you're paying overhead on and what do you do? Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, somebody was telling me the other day, my husband was telling me the other day, he went to the office on a Monday and it was so hot because I think they turned the air conditioning down over the weekends oh. and it takes a long time and it's been very hot for it to cool off. So they're trying to find ways in which to create savings. Um and, and so that's on one side. On the other side is the need to actually have talent come together and learn from each other. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of companies are settling in on this three plus two, three days in the office, two days at home, that mix. But I think you give offer people the flexibility to figure out when they can be, always having the option 
that mm -hmm. there should be a Zoom link, allow people to be able mm -hmm. and yet encourage them gently but nicely to say, come in and do things in the office that allow people to understand what is to be gained by being there. Make the If you come into the office and all you're doing is hanging on Zoom calls, then why even bother to come in, right? Well, this is, it. so my view is it has to be looked at team by team, yep. task by task, plus a layer of connection and how we're building relationships. And that needs to be discussed team by team. And I think one of the aspects that's not often considered is the leader's own needs for interaction and feedback and so on. Yep. So I facilitate actually leaders and their teams coming together to have a discussion where there's some support for the discussion so that we can have what I call compassion infused compromise. Yep. So we can look at what do we need to get done? How can we best do this? Figure our subset of synchronous meetings and then figure out, okay, what cadence does it need to have? And then you'll find people come together and say, oh, that makes sense. But to have even three plus two without really anchoring in why, and yep. when you've got time zones and all of the things, I mean, I think it's team by team and it's that nuanced. So I'm looking for more opportunities for those discussions to happen. Um, but I hear you. Absolutely. There's advantage to being in person. I'm, I'm onboarding now with an organization in the UK. And I'm, it's a bit challenging to get enough of people's time and even to know how to coordinate that. You know, is it, is it, do I just message you on chat? I'm not really good at this, this whole, you know, email plus Slack kind of um, duality, which came up since I left the corporate world. It's, um, it's trickier. So some structure needs to be there. And then we need to have that mindset that you were talking about um, earlier. Um, I want to come back as probably as, as we move towards wrapping up a little bit, I want to come back to what I thought I heard loud and clear from you as a successful path towards inviting people to embrace diversity was connecting it to the business, connecting it to the business and not making it just HR and embedding it almost in the way you do things, but connecting to the value. You talked about measuring in your company, 10% of people are neurodivergent. Um, can you connect for me a little bit this connection to business and where measuring comes in, because if you, you may not know unless you're asking the questions internally and externally. Um, I'd, I'd love you to share on that. So I, I gave you the example of Freddie Mac with the increased engagement, yeah, the sense of well-being and the gratitude that employees felt to, towards the organization and towards their own lives. But workplaces that have more inclusive working environment, especially for disabled employees, visible or invisible, yeah. um, report higher revenues, report higher employee retention. There's You can translate each one of them into dollars and cents. Mm -hmm. and, and so if you take retention as an example, increasing retention actually has a price tag attached to it. Every employee you turn over, it costs you about a time and a half their salary every time they turn over, okay? So, so learning to understand that workplace culture isn't just sort of a check the box endeavor, yeah. but rather bringing in um, a way, in fact, I think it was the, I watched on Squawk Box the other day, the CEO of Bank of New York, Mellon, was talking about what he is doing to, to make culture such a key linchpin in, in terms of his strategy. And he's reporting, they were asking him, your earnings are way up, other banks are struggling, you're doing so well, what's going on here? Mm -hmm. And he attributed it to culture. He attributed mm -hmm. it to employee engagement. He attributed it to reduced turnover. So mm -hmm. he had a way to measure how that all translated into higher earnings. Mm -hmm. So I think companies can do that. And what is interesting is, you know, you still have a large uh, percentage of the neurodivergent population that still masks in the organ in, inside their organizations. And the sure. reality is, look, if they are not open about it, I think other people observing them, you can say that person's quirky, you can you can use other adjectives with it. Mm -hmm. But once you know, all you feel is a sense of awe to say, mm -hmm. wow. This, this this person is really kick-ass great. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. And, and I think that creating the environment where you allow them to be open mm-hmm. about it, acknowledge it, also helps you teach them how to ask for help because there are areas where they need help and support. Yeah. And and organizations need to build infrastructure to be able to help them. But we also need to respect and trust their boundaries that they have about waiting till they are ready to acknowledge it. You can't force this on them. Just because you think they are doesn't mean you, you know, provide them with the solutions for it and then, you know, drill it down. You, you've got to respect them yeah. and allow them to come and say, you know, I want to acknowledge and this, I've been diagnosed with this and I need some help. I need coaching. I need, and, and yeah. that is where you have to step up and do your part in helping support them. But you also need to respect their boundaries. Most definitely. It's interesting too, as we unpack a little bit, the needs from the medical model of disability and come more towards the social model, which is not looking for a diagnosis. And so the, the work style profile that I mentioned to you briefly when we, we spoke earlier, the, it's basically a one page to say, here's what you need. I'd love you to know about me to invite my best performance. And so it gives the person, they don't have to say a diagnosis, but they might say, I need a lot of guidance about what's coming next, or I need clear instructions, or I need um, I need that quiet place to work. It's it's an opportunity for self-expression around need rather than connecting it, not necessarily connecting it to a diagnosis, or maybe, you know, I, I got my autism diagnosis on a Saturday and I took it into a television segment on a Monday. That was rapid fire disclosure for me. But my well, multiple sclerosis, I took seven years to talk about it. Before I could actually say it out loud, I was afraid no one would hire me. I was afraid I would just look incapable. And uh, so I, I get what you're saying. There's a journey towards disclosure. And what I'm hoping to offer is an opportunity to say, hey, I have I have some needs that really help me shine. And I'm trying to facilitate that discussion. So we get to that compromise I was talking about. You know, the other other part about it is having a, a, a disability or a neurodivergent subset within the disability ERG is phenomenal. Mm-hmm. And what is interesting is that you will have a, a, a healthy mix of parents of individuals, mm-hmm. siblings of individuals that are neurodiverse. Mm-hmm. And sometimes they speak for them, but you have to also be able to discern that difference between what the individual would want for themselves versus what the parent wants for them or the sibling wants for them. So mm-hmm. I, I think that when we have these ERGs, just like you have, you know, LGBTQ uh, ERGs and you have allies yes. and you have to listen and you need the support of the allies, but you have to really listen to the members of that community themselves to understand what it is. And you know what? Each one is just that one. They are unique. Yeah. And you have to be thoughtful about knowing yeah. that you cannot take what you learn about one and just sort of brush everybody with that same stroke. That's right. I've just been asked to actually give a presentation to a disability ERG in a rather large organization. And that is definitely a point I'm making. It's it's around more about the mindset of asking questions and staying open, which you were talking about culturally needs to be in place as well. So I think there's a big culture shift that's that's really happening. It is happening now. And I'm really proud that that larger corporations are beginning to really appreciate and understand yeah. how to how to embrace and engage mm. and and uh, leverage people for their abilities instead of discarding for them them for their disabilities. Beautiful, beautiful. Uh, my last invitation for you is for a leader who's, gosh, yes, I know it's supposed to make business sense and and I'm I get, it's supposed to intuitively connect all the dots and I'm supposed to do this, but. I don't feel like I've got time for it, patience for it. This is hustle, man. We've got numbers to meet, objectives to hit. How do I, how do I get to feeling like I can slow down for someone who might need more time to process and think of a response? What would you say to that leader? I would say to them, um, bring it and make it very personal. Imagine this person was, depending on your age, your child, your sibling, 
mm-hmm. your friend and ask yourself if it, this was someone you really cared deeply about would you not take that little extra moment no matter how busy you are and i've always thought this about issues if you can make it very personal mm-hmm. All of a sudden, you react to it in a way that is very different when it's somebody else. And and I always bring it close to home. I take that moment um, to say right when I'm getting impatient with someone and, hey, I'm not the world's most patient person. I am not. I will fess up to that. But I will also tell you that I have a lot of empathy and compassion. Mm -hmm. And I ask myself, if this was my son, if this was my daughter, how would I want them to be treated? Mm-hmm. And it means that you just try a little bit more. You pause a little bit more. And it doesn't mean you don't give direct feedback. It doesn't mean you you don't say to them, you've come up short here and this does not work. And mm-hmm. for do this job, you have to be able to do this. How can I help you get there? It doesn't mean that you have to accept them, but you also have, to be realistic about what it is that they will be capable of, because there are some things they are not going to be able to do. And you have to understand that. And the answer to you is, do I then support them in a way that their uh, challenges don't derail them? Mm -hmm. Or do I just let them sink and then just move them on out of the organization? And so if your intent is that I value their abilities enough then you will find a way to make space for understanding their disabilities and allowing other people to step in to help fill that gap a little bit. Yeah. And that's a perfect way to end this conversation. Um, some invitations, some words of wisdom. Thank you so much, Suba Berry, for joining me. Um, listeners, you can find so much more out at saramount.com. Look at the work they're doing. They're publishing fabulous research all the time, holding events, and game-changing. If your organization is looking for support on moving more thoroughly into this space and being more effective with your diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives, look no further than saramount.com. You'll find so many resources. Thank you so much, Suba, for joining me today. Claire, thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thanks so much for spending time here. Check out happyspacepod.com for links to all the episodes, including on YouTube, our online community, and helpful tools for work that fits. I'd love to hear from you. Leave a comment on social media, or even better, drop a review. And please, share with someone else who you know also deserves a happy space.